writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of science fiction, horror, mystery, and poetry, as well as articles, and on self-defense and music. And with me today is... Uh, Brad R. Cook. I write uh, steampunk and many, many other things. Uh, I have a novel coming out in November, Iron Horseman. Check it out. And other than that, I'm president of St. Louis Writers Guild, and I'm a publisher at Blank Slate Press. I'm Matthew McGraw. I'm an amateur short story writer. Uh, I'm also working on a picture book called uh, Patrick the Spider, which is ever so close to being done. And for those out there, before I let the next person introduce themselves, Matt always calls himself an amateur writer because he does not consider consider himself to be professional until he gets paid. I need that money. Yes. I'm Melanie Colaney. I uh, write science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction. And poor Melanie today is outnumbered by us guys, which is a rarity on this show. Yeah, last week it was the other way around. Yeah. I think... This is kind of a small crew, too. Yeah. yeah. We just have us four today. Yeah. Um, those who are not with us, of course, are with us in spirit. We miss you. We'll but keep today, them in our memories. Yes. Yeah. But today we're going to talk about a very strange topic in writing. Generally, it, it aims more at science fiction writers, but it can apply to others, especially mystery, and I'll explain that in a moment. I'd throw out steampunk writers being... Steampunk as yeah, well? Yeah, that's yes, probably a prime example. Yeah. That is a good example. Yeah, and also... Okay, we we got to get to the topic. Let's get to the topic before about. everybody gets started. Yeah. The topic is, are, do, when we write, are we writing futurism, or are we writing wish fulfillment? Or pastism. Or pastism. <laughs> Romanticized. Yeah, I was, I was thinking the historical fiction is very often wish fulfillment. Yeah, so, I, I would say, sorry, that steampunk mm-hmm. is very much in the wish fulfillment side of this talk. Um, Most certainly. You know, I, I would love to think that there's, you know, half the stuff that w- that I have in my book was uh, was really around in the Victorian age. They could have done it, uh, but I, I don't really think they did. Yeah, so let me pull this back and then we're going to get right yeah. to that. And I can throw out something, too, with history-wise. But be, let's let's talk about defining what we're talking about. Futurism, or being a futurist. I'm going to throw out some examples. Gene Roddenberry, from Star Trek. Arthur C. Clarke. Ben Bova. Isaac Asimov. Now, there's a whole list more that I could just keep going, but I really want to throw out some, some top four authors or writers in that, in that grouping. In the case of Arthur C. Clarke... He started really writing well because of futuristic style or futurist ideas during and after World War II. A lot of his stuff comes into play. For example, geosynchronous orbit, otherwise known as Clark's orbit. Um, and as well as some AI stuff and so forth. You got Isaac Asmanov. Do I really need to go into that for you guys at all? Um, well, not for us, but yeah, I was for, referring to for, the, I was for referring people to. that don't know science fiction, uh, he wrote 2001, A Space mm-hmm. Odyssey, plus 2010. And no, two- no, that's Arthur C. Clarke. Oh, yeah. sorry. Isaac oh, sorry. Is no, Foundation. I wrote Foundation. Sorry, I yes. read that too. He also wrote some rules for robots. Yes, the, 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 the three Asimovs. Which yeah. we've talked about before. Yep. Right. And uh, frankly... The ability to program those into robots is a major scientific achievement that hasn't quite happened yet. Right. And then um, Ben Bova, who is currently still writing science fiction, one of the things that I throw him into the futurist idea is he was coming up with ideas such as peacekeeper forces before such forces existed. And nowadays, you see that on the news constantly. Yes. Well, I would throw out that a lot of the people you are throwing out mm-hmm. are futurists. Yes. And partly due to the fact that, you know, if you take Arthur C. Clarke, I mean, he was a scientist who was actually working in some of these fields, and then he went home at night and wrote about what he was kind of doing in his day job and just kind of took it a little bit crazier. And what he did during World War II as yeah, well. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you take it that way, then these guys had a little bit more of a knowledge towards what was coming down the pipe. Right. And, and what could be foreseen and scientifically possible and push it forward. 
Um, you know, when I sit there and I write science fiction, I, I don't really think of it so much as predicting the future, so much as it is, I wanted to write a space opera coolness with, you know, my ships weren't as pretty as, you know, Star Trek, they were more like, you know, Firefly or Star Wars or something like that, and then I mean more the Rebels than the Empire, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm thinking more in terms of that than in terms of, oh, in the next mission to Mars, it's actually probably going to take, like, you know, this many months and it's uh-huh. going to do all that. So you can write futuristic science fiction and you can also write wish fulfillment science fiction. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, and, uh, for instance, H.G. Uh, Wells was also a futurist. Oh, yeah. most certainly. Or, and Jules Verne. Yes. And I'm glad... Throwing it back to the steampunk. Yes, and I'm going to actually borrow from, from your role there on information. So let me throw Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. Perfect Gene Roddenberry was a cop at one time. <laughs> I can imagine where he got some of his ideas. But he his futuristic idea was more aimed at social yep. futurism, which is getting rid of all the stupid racism and sexism. And getting rid of money. Getting rid of money, good luck, but <laughs> that's his ideas. I still love the fact that nothing in Star Trek costs anything. Yes. So, except when you get except later. Except in the Latinum and all that. Well, we, yeah, but that's the rest of the alien races. Now, I promised I'd throw this into mystery field as well, so let me do that yeah. just briefly. Let's go back in time a little bit to Sherlock Holmes. I was going to say, perfect example. Sherlock Holmes, or rather Arthur Conan Doyle, who applied basically physician diagnoses to the idea of crime solving and forensics and forensic science. It's funny, I was listening to something talk, uh, actually a book, where the story was taking place with some FBI guys, and they're talking about how inside of a car, we- car wheel's hood, they were able to knock off granite or whatever and figure out where this car had been. And I'm sitting in the background, A, I'm not sure that really would happen as far as how long it would be, that would be a question for my cop friends, but B, Sherlock Holmes just popped right in, it's like, yeah, you got the FBI... Modern day is literally a descendant of a futuristic ideas by Arthur Conan Doyle. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. which ahead. is funny given how spiritualistic he was. And yeah, Conan Doyle also wrote detective. Well, I mean, in addition to the Sherlock Holmes detective stuff, he also wrote science fiction. Yes, he did. He did. The he original wrote a book Lost called, World. Yeah. <laughs> um, but does the FBI study uh, ash patterns? Yeah. And cigars. So. I think so. Really? You can analyze. They made an that. actual thing out of that. People pretty huh. much study everything. I mean, yeah. they, they've got an entire farm where they just let bodies decompose. Yeah, the oh, body yeah, farm. I've heard about that. Yep. So, I mean, you know, they, 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 they get crazy. Yes. So, but it's all science. If you write right. it down, it's science. <laughs> <laughs> but now, here's the, here's the question. Is the idea of writing science fiction and steampunk and so forth in those genres, when we're creating a futuristic world... Are we being romantic about it? And what I mean by romantic, I'm not talking about a romance novel. I'm talking about how some people try to romanticize historical novels. Uh, well, maybe not so much uh, history, but uh, you know, Gene Roddenberry, Star Trek is always like the prime example of seeing what you want to see in the future. <clears throat> like he had, you know, kind of like a little agenda almost of like not well, a, the, not so little. <laughs> things he'd like to see in the future. We get rid of money. He's like, eh, money is maybe not so great. We got rid of great. poverty. Yes. Get rid of poverty. Uh, get rid of racial tensions to bring in more of an equality in the workforce. I just and bring not racial, together. just also uh, sex, you know, like uh, between wanted, the two sexes. Yeah, well. Gene Roddenberry yeah. wanted the Enterprise to have a 50-50 male-female crew. The network turned him down. He yeah. had to fight for... The, the ones he got. Yeah. yeah. Gene Roddenberry, I do admire. I mean, just look at her horror. Black, female, number four in the chain of command. Not said. But that was never obvious. <laughs> well, yeah, but <laughs> yes, it was obvious to those. It was by the who time of the movie, catching yes, on. But yeah, yeah, it was obvious to those who caught on. That's okay. Uh, the Asian guy ended up being totally one of the major captains of the whole thing, and that exactly. was unheard of back in the like sixties and especially before. considering he, the Asian guy, George Takei. Thank you. Um, is who's awesome and married who to a is brat. Japanese and consider is the Japanese. timeline. Yes, and consider the time. That's where I was going. Consider the timeline. But, he uh, talks about it in his book. Go ahead. But I mean, uh, it, just in comparison, like he wasn't necessarily like looking around when he was conceiving it. He wasn't looking around at the world around him and necessarily thinking, 
this is where I see things going. Well, that's a good question. Like, especially with, like, money, you know? There's no, you know, here we are, like, what, 50 years later, maybe? There's no yeah, yeah. chance the money's going away anytime no. soon. No, but he did, like, and I think that's almost part of the wish fulfillment. He, there was no direct line towards the socialism change that was mm-hmm. happening. You know, I mean, the 60s were going on, and there was change happening. He He could feel that pulse, but the reality is, is that there was no guarantee of any of that change. You know, so in essence, it is wish fulfillment. It's putting out into the future what you'd like to see, and hoping the world catches up to that. But let me go ahead and go with the money thing. It's kind of the opposite of well, it's the opposite of dystopian. How can things go wrong? It's this utopian. Is, is this how can things go right? Right. And just real quick, let's look at some of the stuff that have. Uh, it's unless aspirational. You jump, unless That's you want to jump in before him, Brad. No, I was going to talk about the history, yeah, <laughs> historical stuff. Okay, yeah. hold that thought for a moment. I'm yeah. going to turn this right over to history for a second after this. Gene Ronberry's ideas. Let's look at some of the technology. Cell phones came from the idea of communicators. The iPhone and the oh. iPad and all... As uh, I hold up my tablet and as show you, it. Right. His tablet idea came from the pads. Exactly. Um, There's currently the, a contest to build a medical tricorder. Right. Really? Yes. Yeah, I want a tricorder. So do I. The iPod originally came from the idea of being able to have all this music and stuff in one location. Your entire library, if you will. That came from Star Trek. So you've got several things that have occurred technologically. You had brought up, Matt, about money. I'm willing to argue it's not there yet, nowhere near. But the concept of Bitcoin. 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 Bitcoins. 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 Thank you. I knew I was like, as soon as I said it, it was wrong. Bitcoins is trying to aim down that road. I'm not saying this A money that's success. not based on anything. Literally. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, history... Let's, well, I was just going to throw out, we, we kind of touched on this for a second before, and, and I've read a lot of historical fiction, uh, and there's some really good historical fiction that does not gloss over the past. I mean, mm-hmm, very you know. much so. However, there's a lot of historical fiction that plays up the, the really good parts of the past and then doesn't really focus on the bad parts of the past, so there is that kind of level of wish fulfillment as we look back, and I'm totally guilty of that, too. I mean... You know, my characters never really worry about, you know, a Eating lot tuberculosis? Of things. Yeah. Well, actually, I do have tuberculosis in my book. Oh, so, okay. hey, go there. Well, uh, go me. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess. Or you don't Opera get... disease. Yeah. yeah. It's in there all you the know. time. Don't but there's there's a lot of stuff in the past that, you know, we, we gloss over. We don't look at. We don't pay attention to. Social issues, food mm-hmm. issues, health, issues. A whole lot of people issues. die of dysentery in the yeah, past. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I don't have them worried about the water they're drinking and everything like that. It's funny you should say that. Um, a f- acquaintance of mine, friend on Facebook too, and actually some of us at this table, definitely Brad, you know her, Eileen Dreyer, mm, yeah. who is who wrote mysteries, now writes mostly historical romance, was a practicing ER nurse. I and Eileen, you may still be a nurse uh, if you ever hear this episode. I just don't know if your license up to date or not. So I'm, I'm calling you past tense. You very well probably are. Still, but anyway, she was reading a book and she posted this on Facebook about some woman who was a midwife, delivers a baby, and then, you know, does whatever, comes running down the stairs to tell the family, the baby's delivered, the baby's delivered. And the entire time (laughs) throughout her post is character saying, and I'm paraphrasing this, baby's delivered. Eileen Dreyer, wash your hands. Baby's delivered. You've got blood all over your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> the baby's here. The baby's here. Wash your hands. <laughs> so, yeah, it, complete romanticism of yeah. the oh, past. Uh, just for your information, you know, <sighs> whenever a woman goes in labor, they say boil water. That was to sterilize the instruments. Right. <laughs> so. so, but yeah, the past is and the future are things to be played with, I guess. You know, they're. It's it's a scene, it's a it's a setting, and you get to do whatever you want there. So, you know, write the way you want to write. But you can I, also, I definitely think there's a level of wish fulfillment. You can also, though, like a kind of do a wish fulfillment sort of thing, but for practical reasons. Uh, my example for genres would be uh, the western. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. The western is a very like specific time frame in the expansion <laughs> into the west, where there was like it was a sweet spot where there yeah. was just enough law for there to be like some conflict and just enough lawlessness for a hero to you know do whatever, and uh, it's not necessarily like wish fulfillment to imagine this uh, very specific sweet spot existing. It's because that's where the stories are. That's where the drama would be, and that's uh, just the mm-hmm. background for whatever story you want to do. 
And can we expand? What Matt's talking about with the Western is most people's common concept of the Western. I'm just going to really throw yeah. out there before anybody's yelling at us. And the time period you're talking about is a perfect time. We just had the Civil War, generally speaking. Um, it's, yeah, it's usually that time, yeah. right after the Civil War, up until the mid 1800s. Right. So well, it's like mid- a couple right decades. Right to the 1900s. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that year yeah. kind of past the West. Right. But in honesty, the Western can be written but from a time period I've seen as late as post as post not post civil war post American Revolution up to even modern day with um Justified as a perfect example mm-hmm. written by originally written by Elmore Leonard now T V show which I think is finally going off the air, which is sadness. And I'm not even talking about space westerns, I'm just talking about the Western. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So but no, well, you well, brought up I would agree. Okay, it is, it is technically because if you look at the gangster areas of uh-huh. the twenties, twenties and thirties, mm-hmm. and the guys, not not in the not in the, like in Chicago or anything like that, but when Vegas. you get out, well, when you get out and you get the guys who did the driving, like you get the um, you know not the Dillinger gangs, but the other gangs that I can't think of the names of um, Bonnie, Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde. That's what I'm trying to think of. Thank you. But that is your classic western transformed into a 30s where now they've got cars instead of horses Mm -hmm. and they've got bars instead of you know a winchester right but you know what matt's talking about that sweet spot i mean probably what 40 years maybe you got like 40 years of time yeah figure reconstruction time you know yeah you got like 40 years that you can play with there and that's probably about all you've got one generation maybe two Yeah. yeah and when you talk when if you say the word western to a lot of people it's that time period. Yeah, a lot of people it's that picture. You know, I think another element of wish fulfillment, which is definitely too from a writer because you're the god of your own universe, but for a lot of people when they read a book, they some people want clear good guys and clear bad guys. White hats versus black hats. Yeah. Western. Mm-hmm. Not everybody wants that. We now want more complicated villains yeah, and more yes. complicated good guys, but there is something to be said for you know what's right, you know what's wrong. The decisions aren't difficult. They're just, um, they're not morally difficult. They might be physically difficult, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I do like moral nightmares in my stories. But, yeah. That's um, right, the Lone Ranger, he was their version of that complex, crazy yeah. character. He wore a white hat but a mask. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, here is an example of wish fulfillment. Is the entire Western genre as we think of it during that time period. Now, when I was saying that, to the general public. Remember, a moment ago, I just clarified Roy really Western range and so forth, and it contains a lot of different types of stories. I'm going with the hackneyed... Um, Zane Gray version? Zane Gray, yeah. He's not hackneyed, but... The hackneyed version, Hollywood version, whatever, of how people picture the Western. The Western really was nothing more than a, retail, than a knight's tale. The, the good guys on horseback were your knights in shining armor. Believe me, though, a lot of those people in real life, nowhere near. I mean, that's no, a lot of your sheriffs were once outlaws in back then. So that's wish fulfillment. Great example. Um, Brad, you were talking about steampunk and how you wish stuff had existed back well, then. What you write about. Yeah, steampunk, steampunk is the ultimate in kind of a romanticizing the past. I mean, you're taking the past, you're... Like, in terms of my case, I, I'm true to history. It's set in 1881, so nothing that exists after 1881 is in my book. And the only, you know, and I had to do a lot of research for that. I uh, lost a shotgun, actually, because of that. Um, but, you know, they didn't have lightning cannons. Uh, they didn't have airships. Um, oh. They didn't have giant mechanical, you know, iron horsemen that were, you know... Set from the you know yeah. crazy like all kinds of this, but oh. there is a ton of other stuff. You know the steam technology did exist. A lot of this technology did exist. You know airships did exist, just not in the complex versions that you know I yeah. throw out there. They like, didn't get built up and elaborated on as sometimes it shows up in steampunk. Yeah, and to be honest, they they will. I mean the Zeppelin program was huge, and by the time of the, you know. It was supposed to be the dominant force of the 20s and 30s. I mean, that was going to be the number one way we all got around was via Zeppelin. But then, you know, there were a lot of problems in the Hindenburg. And, you know, that kind of ended when people realized, you know, geez, a plane is a lot faster. Yeah. You know, so, we, you know, there's always that. But if you take out that notion, you kind of look back, you go, oh, look what they could have done. Alternate histories are often like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, what if? Well, that's the ultimate in yeah. wish fulfillment fun. And then that's mm-hmm. the whole point of the genre is to have fun. So, I don't know. Yeah. I like it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, uh, beforehand we were talking about um, another form of wish fulfillment more on a personal level, and that probably would be fanfic. So a lot of fanfic is people wanting to write the stories they wished happened, or expanding, or whatever. Uh, yes, and sometimes writing themselves into things. Yes, yes. Mary Sue is a very much wish fulfillment. Well, I, I don't know where Matt was going with that statement, but there's certain people who rewrite stories and the characters to... Just because there might be a Brad Skywalker out there doesn't mean anything. Yeah, well, okay, that's, that's true. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll go with that, but I was going to say more fulfill their Not desire for a certain... Mm-hmm. Yeah, desire yeah, for a certain... It'll pop up anything, don't worry. That kind of story that it could have been. And I really just tapped answer on that. <laughs> I realized that. Um, so, no, but seriously, a little bit of the fanfic thing is wish fulfillment. So you can do whatever you want. In mm-hmm. fact, if you ever want to have some fun, go to Tumblr and see Marvel's headcanon for Avengers. It's hilarious. It's canon in my head. Which okay. means it's just people like putting out stupid little things that maybe totally never would have happened. You know, like Hawkeye going to the coffee shop for something. Uh, weird things like that. But it's hilarious. So, you know, it's fun to check out. But getting back to the futurist side of all of this, uh, looking forward in terms of you know what we do, I think, and we talked about this a little bit in researching your novel. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do the research, if you kind of, you know, if you do the research to what you're trying to write about, and you keep going with that, and you just push it out a little bit further, then you probably are more the futurist than you are a wish fulfiller. Mm-hmm. Well, very much so. But if you're just looking at like internally, what would I like? If I were in charge of the world, how would it be? Yeah. yeah. That's more the wish fulfillment. That's totally That's more wish fulfillment. Of course, you know, it's like, if I made this change, what would be the reasonable things I could expect to happen? Not all of which I would necessarily want to happen, but, you know, some of them... Yeah, it requires a little... That's conflict comes in. This requires a little bit of internal honesty to yeah. just... To uh, theorize a change and then follow it the whole way through, not just as far as you want to go. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is sometimes this wish fulfillment is the genie oh, yeah. for, uh, for the future engineers and the future social engineers to try and create what huh. was once your wish or your desire. Just throwing it out there, I mean, you know, we were talking and joking, you know, we all have, like, smartphones and tablets and stuff sitting out here around us, mm-hmm. and the reality is is that that technology has been in science fiction for years. Oh, yeah. Years and years and years, and it did not exist in any way, shape, or form in reality. So this has all been put together by, you know, guys who have grown up, and and probably a couple of generations of guys who've grown up hearing stories about, you know, Buck Rogers doing this, or Flash Mm -hmm. Gordon doing this, or, you know, Luke Skywalker doing this, and now we have this. So hoverboards and lightsabers, I really hope, are coming on the way. (laughs) And... Yeah, that, oh, yes. no, you and I with a lightsaber would be just downright <laughs> scary. Um, just real quick, I'm going to say a couple examples. One, you talked about Dick Tracy, or I think you said Dick Tracy a moment ago. Maybe not. He wasn't one of the mentions of it. Okay, but I'm going to mention Dick Tracy. The um, Samsung watches. Yep. And, which and the I've Apple got on, watches. And yep. now the Apple watches. watches. Guess where that idea came from? And that was a comic. Um Okay, people have been growing hearts in the laboratory for years in mm-hmm. science fiction. Guess what? They can do it in they rodents do it now. now. Yep. Yeah. Um, let me go also to Frederick Poole. I'm trying to remember which story it was I was reading. Published in 1970s, 1980s. I, I emphasize the time period of when he published it because this is before the Internet became popular or became wide, wide use. If it was in use, it was used at the universities only. He's talking about they're on a space plane traveling from one continent to another continent, and they haven't arrived yet, but on the plane, a char- one of the characters pulls out what we would today call a laptop, gets on what we would today call, oh, I don't care, um, Priceline or whatever, reserves his hotel on it, and then... He has them basically take out his credit card and run it through a scanner that's attached to the, what I'm calling a laptop. To us, today, that doesn't sound too unfuturistic. Yeah, I mean... But that was really 30 years ago, uh, plus it was... Yeah, 2001 had something that looked very much like an iPad in it. Yes, it did. Yeah. 
with well, the okay. internet. <laughs> Take we were we were talking about Jules Verne earlier. Oh god, yeah. So if you want to go, we're going way back into steampunk roots here, and we're going to talk about futurism. I mean, looking All from the earth fiction. to the, you know, looking from the earth to the moon, which he wrote you know in 1865, and you know then a uh, hundred years later plus we would actually go and live up to that mm-hmm. and, and actually the, make it didn't to the, the shuttle weigh just about exactly what he said the shuttle weighed in his good book? point actually yeah, that's that actually a good point but you know now he wanted to shoot it out of a giant cannon and aim it up there at the world <laughs> at the moon but that's not the way it ended up happening <laughs> but God. it inspired but... a lot of people over the next right. century oh yes and before uh, we were able to do it ourselves on something that you know the original series of star trek compl- uh correctly predicted that we would make the moon landing on a Wednesday. Yeah. It was a pure chance, but you know. Yeah. Now here's another one. Um, staying with Jules Verne. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The Nautilus, run by what would later be described as a nuclear There's, engine. Yep. And now all of our submarines basically have giant nuclear engines powering them. Not the all of them, but a lot the of them. The vast majority of them, and yeah. you know, a lot of the biggest ones. Yes. Mm-hmm. Especially if they're boomers. Exactly. Um, they're meant to stay down there forever now. So, I'll, I'm going to change subjects a little bit out here. You know, actually, no, I'm going to pause myself for a second. I just came up with something else. Brad, you talked about steampunk. I'm going to go back to steampunk for just a second. And that's really not my territory of, of expertise. But I'm going to go back for back more in history. If you go back to ancient Roman Empire, if I get my right time frame... If it may have not, if it's not early empire, it's late republic. You had hero of Alexandria, who actually came up with working models of jet engines, of steam engines. Actually, yeah, it was a steam engine. But steam to engine. be honest, I mean that and, was yeah. that was for like you know a, a, it was less an engine. Let's put it that way. It, was, it really was. He also came up with ideas what we would today call robots and so yep. forth. He would have the worked. automaton, the automatic the door. I mean, a yes. ton of stuff. Of course, then we had a black time in history as far as technology is concerned. Otherwise known as the Dark Ages, which we lost a lot of our technology and our philosophy. And a lot of heroes' ideas didn't come about because slavery was cheaper than trying to build this stuff. I'm, I'm being honest with the time period of history. So... Could that also play into wish fulfillment with your fantasy and your mystery in your science fiction stories, be it steampunk, be it stuff in which we are writing for futuristic science fiction? Or alternate history. Right. Especially for me, actually, because I, I play actually with the Templars and uh, alchemists and, you know, that whole kind of notion of mm-hmm. the old world pulling still up some stuff from the past. So I actually play a lot with that, and that's total wish fulfillment for me, you know. I have, you know, these great secret societies kind of going against each other in Europe. Did it happen? Yeah. Did it happen the way I say? No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it, it, it's fun. Yeah, is it more interesting to hear it that way? But, and that's like, there's a part of wish fulfillment that's like, not just for you, but for your audience as oh, well. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, Adding something of interest there that maybe the actual history didn't have, but, you know, would have been... Oh, neat. I started off with a very clear purpose when I wrote Steampunk. I wanted to have... Uh, broadsides that you know the classic two ships next to each other just pounding the hell out of each other thousands of feet in the air with giant airships ripping themselves apart and then finally coming down in fiery crashes Hmm. you know that vision was very much like with me through and there's actually several scenes in my book where there's massive airship combat you know, did it happen in real life? No. Nope. Did Could it have happened? Eh, if they'd done a lot of work that they didn't know how to do, <laughs> but we know how to do now, yeah, they totally could have done it. But, you know, the reality is, it's really cool. Yeah, if I remember my history <laughs> right, there was, con- once again, was never done, but there were concepts of making ships like that oh, no, no. for uh, World War One and World War Two. Yeah, yeah, the, the Navy built uh-huh. uh, built a blimp. That they actually would uh, fly planes out of. So they'd launch a little fighter plane out of this blimp. It would fly around, do its mission, fly back, get grappled by the blimp, and get pulled back up. They had one of those in Indiana Jones. They yeah, did. They did. They did, in fact. That was totally based off the Navy's plan. And then the Navy realized it was really, really hard to land this, you know, grasp onto this little plane that was coming up. 
And then it was really, really hard for the guy to get into the plane and out of the plane. So they and it was like, probably kind of easy to you know shoot the. <laughs> well, actually, it made more sense to have an aircraft carrier. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the reality is that they they realized how to put a, a, a landing strip on top of a boat. Then they didn't need one up in the air. Right. But the air one would have been so cool. Yes. Well, you know, my, my favorite for wish fulfillment is, act, for science fiction wish fulfillment, is the space elevator. And I really hope that they start to build it in my lifetime. Well, guess what? I don't know if it's in your lifetime or not, but Japan is looking at starting and building in, tw- or to have it around 2050. I think they'd start within my lifetime if they're yeah. going to get it yeah. down between. But I, I just saw an article today about that. Yeah. So. Does that mean it would hit California if it fell? <laughs> oh, uh, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> A nice land bridge between Japan and exactly. California. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some other um, futurist ideas or in stories or that you like to use in your story? Or what do you have as a futurist idea that you might have well, some there. of the best, and this is the best because these are actually out there. So these are going to come probably in the lifetime of the little kids who are starting to listen to this. But you've got uh, um, there's little kids force fields. I've got to clean this up. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good point. You're going to learn some things, kids. <laughs> yeah. Don't but tell your parents. Force fields for one. So <laughs> we actually have the ability to put a force magnetic force field around certain objects and you know electromagnetic fields and stuff like that. I'm pointing at Brad real quick. I'm going to jump in there. Um, this year, I want to say summer, I don't remember exactly when, they came out with news. They figured out how to make a tractor beam. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're like so close to a starship there. Transporters. Yes, yes. transporters. You know, we figured out how to, tra- you know, t- break something down, which scares the heck out of me. There's individual, <laughs> you know, molecules and fire them off to a new place and reassemble them over here. Ah, that's scary to me. We but scary. I don't think the airlines are going to yeah. let people do that, no. but no. I don't I'm think bones, people are going to let people do that. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's one of those things where, like, Star Trek people are so blasé about something I know. that would be well, so Sam, I want terrifying. You McCoy. Yes, I am with McCoy. In, in Enterprise, they were much less <laughs> blasé <laughs> about it. This but, is you know, true. You know, it's also interesting, too, some of these futuristic ideas. Since we're stuck on transport for just a second, I'm going to borrow it. There is a whole entire social political discussion on a technology that does not exist yet which is the transporter which is the concept or question of if you get to trans- t- let's say I walk into a transporter here in St. Louis and I appear in Paris, France you know, that's where I come out at am I still the same person? Do I have a soul? and so forth I mean, it, there's actually books written not fictional books we're talking, we're actually talking philosophy about books. philosophy yes. books hmm. on this already so, yeah, yeah re- redefining what a person is is mm-hmm. one of my favorite topics. I'm not sure if that's so much wish fulfillment as that's examining societal issues. Well, oh, you could oh. see that as a futurist thing because yeah, they're yeah. starting to have like you know uh, artificial like prosthetics that are yeah, like, robotic. Yeah, at what point yeah. does it? Yeah, and eventually that's gonna. Well, we're gonna be okay with it, I think, as long as it's like the body. But once you get into like the brain, you know, then it's gonna. But they're doing brain start implants questions. now to like restore mental functions. And oh, one of the things I like playing with in science fiction, and it's not a lot of it isn't science fiction. It's implantable technology. So, like a computer oh, yeah. that's actually implanted inside your body. Wet wire. Yeah. Wet wire computers in your brain, like when you jack Something in. that comes up in cyberpunk line. Oh, yeah. 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 But Eek. I actually like it it's when the technology most... functions as it's supposed to. Yeah, it's Matrix, the... Johnny other... Mnemonic. I mean, tons Gene of Gene Run Bears, Andromeda. Yeah. And so forth. The idea but... of jacking in is huge. And the funny thing is, is now we're a wireless society. So, are we really going to jack in, or are we just going to log into Wi Fi? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we Wi Fi it in. You know, so th- that notion of shoving a giant, like, you know, cord into my head. <laughs> was kind of freaky and scary and was made mm-hmm. for really cool sci-fi but the reality is we're probably going to not well, have to Well, it might be the like uh, it might be the cyberpunk version of uh Vern's canon, you know, mm-hmm. where he like he had kind of the idea but he was building off what was around him. Yeah. So he like just had the wrong Well, one of the things I like about it, for instance, right now they can do this. They've done this in research studies. For a real medical reason, they took the skull off someone's brain. And they put sensors on the surface of the people's brains. And with these sensors, 
the this was for people that are trying to figure out where their seizures are coming from. So there was a real medical reason for doing this. But point is, the person can mentally control cursors like yeah. a mouse yeah. on the screen. So if well, someone people with you know uh, debilitating illnesses where and they it lose takes all five all. minutes to train. Yes, yeah. this is great. I mean, and you know they're they're using that same impulse that would move your arm. Only now it's moving a cursor mm-hmm. around. So for them, it's a very natural thing to do. But another concept with cyberpunk for futurism. Mm-hmm. Is the idea of downloading a personality into a virtual reality, and that's been mm-hmm. done in comic books and that's all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Last, last really good example of that being done in fiction was the TV show Caprica, which was uh, the prequel to Battlestar Galactica. Oh, there was a movie that came out. Batman I didn't Beyond see did a great it. episode. Yes, of that. it did. But before you get started, yeah. if you want, to, if you really want to see how what would support such an idea, watch Caprica's pilot. The um, virtual reality version of one of the characters literally spells it out of that all the stuff that's out there right now, all the information on every single one of us is out there enough to be able to make that data. Or right, and so, right? How close are we to that? Hmm, who knows? Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying there was a movie. I think Johnny Depp was in it. I didn't see the movie. Johnny oh yes. Yeah. Was that was that Johnny Monic? The one where you, which one? I okay. I didn't see it in the theaters, but I believe he was a researcher, and then the researcher was killed. But then there was like a ghost and machine. Story. Oh no no no! Um, yeah, it's, this uh, came out recently. Yeah yeah, yeah. that's the other one. Within Sorry, I thought year. you were talking about that. We were because we were talking about that one, the jacking. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, I was going to throw out one of my favorite pieces of technology that's right around the corner here, mm-hmm. and, and that is the replicator. Yes. Yes. You know, because I would love to be able to walk up to some, you know, wall in my house and be able, like, you know, well, I'm in the mood for ice cream, and then boom, it makes me ice cream. That would be awesome. And to be honest with you, NASA's working on it. Yes, no, the 3D we're working on that. printer is the beginning of that, where uh-huh. I can walk up and say... Make my you know, look like this. Yeah, or I can say, you know, hey, make me something. You know, and that ability. Now, granted, right now it takes hours and it's plastic and it gets layered down. And if it were food, it's going to be some weird they've strange done, particle that gets, you know. They've uh, done but, things with food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, you no, have no, to no. Put the food concentrates in. Right. Yeah, and, but, yeah, and he yeah. mentioned it, NASA. NASA's totally NASA working, working on, on the 3D printer for food so that the guys, up, you know, can right. make food. They're, just, they're working mm-hmm. on 3D printers. Cut. Yeah. It would cut the cost of sending yeah. anybody to Mars, the moon, yeah, you yeah. name it. Gigantically, and all I'm going to say before I turn this over to Matt, who is patiently waiting, um, Earl Grey tea, hot. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I was just thinking, there's a maybe a good example of like a wish fulfillment and futurism meeting, which is a, I think it's Ray Kurzweil. He wrote a book about a a guy who meets somebody from the future who's been uploaded into a computer oh. and is from like a civilization of mostly people who have been uploaded into a. Uh, Network system. Do you remember the title? Or? Uh, yeah, this is book. Like it was something in me, you know, like okay. some kind of like really mundane title. Okay. But uh, Rick Kurzweil is a guy who's like big into life extension technologies. Oh, Cairo, and, uh, cryonics, cryonic storage, another futurism. Yeah, Go ahead, and I got another one too. Go ahead. You just remind me of it. Go well, ahead. I'm thinking like that could be kind of two things where he sees like he looks at the stuff around him, sees like maybe it's going this direction, but he's also a guy who's like desperately taking vitamins and such. So I also think like maybe he's an atheist who's terrified of death, and he just <laughs> he's really hoping he can ride the life extension technology up, like he's planning. Two stories talking about life extension. And I'm glad I was talking to Kathleen, who wanted to make it today but couldn't, to discuss this topic. Um, I was telling her, here's an example of one. I'm going to use the term that was used in Babylon 5, which is anti-agathic. An anti-agathic is a drug, lack of a better phrase for it, that extends life by either retarding it or stopping Retarding the, aging. Retarding aging or stopping the aging process altogether. Now this has been done, this has been used in David Weber's Honor Harrington. Well, okay, series. sorry, most famously the jellyfish can do this. Yes. Uh, you know, where it reverts back to its infant state and then grows again. It grows again. Which is kind of creepy to me, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Another example, and a reason I really like to use the Babylon 5 version because Babylon 5 uses a the negative side of this, which is... In Babylon 5, there's only one episode with it, which I think it's called Death Walker, is the idea, yeah, you can make this, but you've got to kill a whole lot of people to get the ingredients. Yeah, with the living forever, living a long time, I mean, there's uh, 
whole lot of science fiction. I don't know if this is mm -hmm. wish fulfillment or futurism that explores what are the implications of no one dying of natural causes. Oh, there's a great one of those. I can't again. I can't remember the title, but it's a. Uh... It's like a future where like everyone moves between planets and like portals, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, with trains. Maybe this oh, is making this you think wasn't of it. trains. What I saw, it was like a one of those like the portals. You know, just step through and mm -hmm. you're into another world. Yeah, and they actually can make new bodies for you and transfer. Oh, yeah. I was going to say. Well, it was something like do that. Do you just declare there can be only one, give everyone a sword, and see what happens? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's go, Brad. It's, it's going to be down afraid, to you and I at the end. I, I'm afraid I don't remember the title of this book at all, but, you know, you get the thing of, oh, yeah, your dad is several hundred years old, and he's married to a 20-year-old, and, uh, you know, you might be 200, but you have a full sibling that's mm -hmm. 100. Only, wait a minute, it's not exactly a full sibling, because both of your parents are in different bodies than they were than when you were born. And Yeah, see, that gets confusing. Yeah. I think I just like to retain myself, either as the vampire or, you know, <laughs> the you immortal, know, immortal state. A lot of where I just get to kind of live on. Vampire fiction is wish fulfillment. Oh yeah. yeah. The, this idea of the anti-agathic, because that's really mm -hmm. what you're talking about, has been around for decades Ever. and, uh, and, and, and even longer. And just, in, just in science fiction alone, historically speaking, all I do say is Fountain of Youth. Yes, that, I mean that throws up a whole lot oh, of alchemy for hundreds of years. Yeah. People. Devoted themselves to finding right some sort of you know cure of death, and in in, in episodes but of like the, if you look at the Egyptians, I mean you can oh, take God. it all the way back. You know their entire death yeah. ritual is about you know not dying and continuing and living on, and you know that whole belief that you're going to continue on. Exactly. I mean they had to continue to get fed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, that's true. You took food into them. Yeah. Um, the idea I was going to say a modern science fiction. You had Twilight Zone. Um, you've got books with this, short stories I've read with this are go back decades ago. In fact, there's one not too long ago I read um, that was written, I mean, written recently where basically you were talking about body swapping. Mm -hmm. You have, oh, yeah, this will be my perfect body for next time, my next go round. Raz Al Ghul, always Raz going Al after Ghul. Batman, trying to yes. get his body. Yes. <laughs> or putting ourselves back to going to the whole downloading of our personality, put yourself inside of an android. Yeah, I kind. only said it that way to piss him off. It's rage. Mm. I know. I was, <laughs> I was ignoring you on that, but that's all right. Well, I have to I'll, say I'll, that because I say Ra's Al Ghul, after. but that's because I want to piss off Ra's Al Ghul if I ever meet him. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a conversation with you after this. <laughs> hmm. But yeah, uh, but father's name was Rage. Mm -hmm. That's an even weirder thing, though, is like moving into the uh, mechanical body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's like the, Yeah, uh, currently... You would be dead, but maybe that won't be the way it is in the future. You know, what counts as a person? Exactly. I, I like the whole idea of exploring what counts as personhood. Right now, the law is pretty clear. What counts as a person is what the law says as a person. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's pretty much it. But what's currently defined as a person is a human being. Currently, we go by, like, kind of a common sense definition because we don't have all these problems. Yeah, but, uh, but the minute aliens show up, it's like, wait a minute, our definition just broke down. It just built a starship. I think it de deserves the rights of a person. The problem is if it shows up and it's, like, I don't know, an alien that's comprised of, like, thousands of individual, like, ant-sized things, but they did build a spaceship and, it, like, kind of react intelligently... A then, collective intelligence. No one piece of it is intelligent, but all together they're immensely intelligent. A right. hive mind. So it's going to be like, how do we deal... We're not going to know how to like process that sort of thing. That's a lot of what science fiction does. It explores how we could, and the mm -hmm. pluses and minuses of doing all the different ways. Once again, Gene Roddenberry has kind of sort of beat us to this. Um, and really, I don't know if it's his writing or one of his script writers, but if you remember back to Star Trek Next Generation Data on trial for his for his personhood. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh, and speaking of the collective intelligence, I just um, watched a next-gen episode called Home Soil. And again, in that episode, mm -hmm. there were these little silicon, non-organic life yeah, forms yeah. that well. just one wasn't very intelligent. But you got a whole group of them networked together, and they were super intelligent. Well, and here's, mm. here's possible science fact. I say possible because it's not proven. It's just a hypothesis that's out there is that through the World Wide Web, our computers talking to each other are starting to develop a hive mind that are learning and becoming, developing Shh, into a don't human... don't tell them. <laughs> Shh, you didn't hear that little tablet. And what's hilarious, <laughs> hilarious about that 
if, if you ever listen to Tablet Overlords. <laughs> Uh, well, I think it was an X minus one radio drama episode. Going back to yet another topic we had on the Right Pack Radio a while back, which is radio dramas as story as storytelling. Um, there was an episode where they didn't have computers; it was all the machines, your typewriters, your pencils, whatever, suddenly took over the world. Well, there's a biologist who's doing a study right now of plants in the rainforest mm-hmm. and trees in the rainforest. And the belief is is that the entire thing might be, you know, huge acres and acres of area might be an, a, a single organism. Like, not necessarily a single, but, it, you know, having some sort of cohesive life, you know, force to it all with communication running between them all. And if there's a problem over here, the ones over here react. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, we're living in a connected ecosystem where... You know, we have to then think about the implications of that and everything going on with that. But yeah, which is why I love science fiction and writing science fiction is exactly. exploring all this and exploring the human soul in reaction to it. To get into space, though, one thing I always wonder is mm-hmm. like, how much easier is it? Like, you take like a human mm-hmm. person like us, and we have like a bunch of you know needs. We need like gravity, yep. pressure. Well, we don't need gravity food. necessarily. But yeah, well, but our bodies break down in zero g, so yeah, we, we, do. we have to do might, something yeah, about that. That needs to be compensated yeah. for. We don't actually need gravity; we need something to compensate for the but lack. But notice right, they don't know. do that in most science fiction. Well, they have we artificial air. gravity. Yeah, yeah, we need air, but that's every few thing. seconds. And then, like opposed to like, if you could get a human consciousness into a machine, mm-hmm. and then you, it goes up there, it needs electricity, and it doesn't even need electricity necessarily all the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just like open your solar panels and you're fine. Yeah, like how much yeah, easier? Assuming you're would close it, enough to a star. Assu- how much easier would it be to get to another star if mm-hmm. that was all you needed? Mm-hmm. And you're you're right on target with not only science fiction but science fact <coughs> discussion in science fact. I should say not actual occurring yet, which is a concept of a putting ourselves inside the bodies of robots, which we talked about briefly ago. B there is a possible there was there's discussion about genetically engineering the next human in space where you don't need feet you need hands so your two feet would become hands and by the way that was a science fiction novel called uh, falling three Uh by lois mcmaster's bourgeois she had a whole space of a species of space dwelling people that they had you know did they kind of look like spiders? You know, just, yeah, just kind of. Kind of yeah. yeah one I'm going that's creepy. So. <laughs> that is, I am not signing up for the hand feet replacement therapy. Aww. I'll go visit them. I mean, I won't. I won't get the hand feet, but I'll <laughs> yeah. go visit. Uh-huh. Well, I don't have a problem with. I want to shake there, all you know? four I'll accept hands. them as humans and love them, you know, and stuff. But <laughs> I, I think I'm going to pass on the turning my feet to hands. And another element. I'm glad in a way we just brought this up. In another way, some futuristic ideas. That are, have been written about in science fiction and in science philosophy, if I could bear with saying it, is the concept that humanity as we know it will not exist, but that we, would, we as a species will go off and branch off into different directions. So the greys really are future humans just coming back in time There's instead of traveling example. through space. So they're the lamest humans because they have to come back here. Well, no, no, no. The, the theory in the future is, and I would totally do this too, so I'm totally guilty. If I had a time machine and could travel back in time, you know, instead of necessarily just going and traveling space, because I could, you know, stop time and then travel from one point to another, you mm-hmm. know, but if I really could, I'd actually come back and just, you know, check it out. Go see the, you know, Apollo moon launch, you know, just sit there up in space and watch it sail by, you know, mm-hmm. or go see, you know, who actually did shoot JFK or... Maybe go back and watch Caesar get stabbed a bunch of times, or you know, see if Cleopatra really was as kind of hot as they say she was. <laughs> well, actually, they did. Actually, they did say she wasn't all that. No, hot. no, she just had a really good personality. But you know, <laughs> what's the point? Was she, was she, she was super really hot? Was she, you know, like what? Well, you know, no, was she? history was really has these questions, which would make her my type. Um, but I like to. Since we're talking about that, I'd still like to go back to 1888. Who was Jack the Ripper? Yeah, another one. We could tell Fedora. Yeah. Of course, We'd be like, Fedora, you were right. Oh, my God. <laughs> stop the guy. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, but see, that goes back to the whole, can you go back? Can you only go back and watch, or can you, you know, go back and change stuff? Yeah, one thing at a time. Because, you know, everyone wants to go back and kick Hitler's butt. <gasps> oh, you know, that's yes. just, that's universal. I mean, you know. 
Well, not completely universal. There are some idiots out I'm there. I'm sure they're, believe. yeah, but they're not going to get a time machine. Yeah, one of the theories. Otherwise, are, they're going to go back in time and really screw it up. Yeah. One of the theories of time travel is yeah, you can travel back in the past, but you can't travel back in the t- past further than when you first turned on the time machine. So if you built. Which would be really boring. Yeah. Well, but then all the future events, you know? You turn it on today. So really, you can be like travel Pandora's into the future. Box. That's easy. Just yeah, leave then, the planet and come back. Okay. Now here's the question. That's all you got to do to travel into the yeah. future. So. There's, sci- there's scientific ideas about how we could time travel. Yes, mm-hmm. but if you're writing about time travel, is that wish fulfillment, or are you actually trying to look at possibility of a future? It time depends. Travel? Well, I would either. say H.G. Wells <laughs> tried to get us into the whole like, let's see how to build a time machine. Because he actually does spend a few minutes on mm-hmm. how he actually built the time machine. And if you do that in your science fiction, then I think maybe you can call yourself a futurist. If you're trying to help some future, you know, little scientist who's oh. reading your stuff. And by the way, someone that this. actually did come up with the modern idea for the time machine mm-hmm. was really inspired by that book. But the point is, is that, you know, when you have this kind of notion of, like, trying to build something or you're just putting it in, but, it, you know, if I just pop through some rip in time and space uh-huh. and suddenly I'm back in, you know, time and I'm like, oh, and my character's running around If you're a blast. Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's cart, for instance. Exactly. You know, that, that's not, that's more wish fulfillment than yeah. that's, you know, f- you know, good point. Mark Twain was not trying to give us any kind of future technology in that. No. It was just like, wouldn't it be funny if, yeah. and then went from there. Oh, exactly. all the problems that would come with, you know. Yeah. You know, I don't know why, but there's a certain movie if it was that is coming to mind called Final Countdown. I don't know if anyone else says I yep. just watched it here. It is a story, I, I may have a ship wrong, it was done in the 80s, if I remember right. The USS Nimitz, it might have been another aircraft carrier, but the USS Nimitz goes back in time, through a rift, if you will, in time and space, and ends up outside Hawaii, December yeah. 5th, 1941. It's actually a play off the Philadelphia Experiment. It is. And the idea, and the question of is, can you stop a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor? Or do you yeah. even want to? Yeah, or can you, you? Can you, and do you even want to? Do you stop it? And uh, the movie's pretty good, if I remember it right. I enjoyed it back then, so I'm That's a good movie. Yeah, what yeah. happened. I totally recommend seeing it. I, I won't spoil it for everybody. Yeah. I do. I totally remember what happens. But, I do, too. And, and there's a whole thing about, you know, obviously, like, the guy falls in love, and he can't decide, do I want to stay with my girlfriend back in the past or go back to the future? Right. And, all that kind of fun stuff, and it's all totally based off the Philadelphia experiment, which was not necessarily a time travel experiment, but has been since it actually happened. All kinds of stuff have been. I'm not familiar to with him. the Philadelphia. The Philadelphia experiment happened uh, in the '60s or World War II, something World like World War II. But essentially, what happened is, is that they put a bunch of technology to cloak a ship from radar. So that a ship could travel across the oceans without being mm-hmm. spotted by radar. It would be in a field that would keep it invisible. Okay, so they turned it on, and the ship disappeared, and everyone went, wow, that's really amazing. Well, if you believe the legends, and if you believe the stories that are written about it, it actually appeared in another harbor, hundreds of miles away, for a brief time, and then reappeared back in its original place. Uh, And if you believe the movies and some of the other stuff, then some of the guys were like frozen into the deck and had actually fused I through think the deck plate. There was an X Files episode. Yes, there was. Based on there is totally, a, you know, there's been a ton of stuff uh, based on the yeah on the Philadelphia experiment. Um, so you can go check it out. It's it's kind of interesting. Uh, it has dubious sources and all kinds of stuff like that. But that brings up another question. Are urban legends a form of wish fulfillment? Well, yeah. I mean, on some Certain ways. Certain ones. How they get extrapolated. I yeah. mean, like, what, uh, usually the incident it's based on isn't much of anything. But then people add their imagination to it and it yeah. becomes a story. Mm-hmm. Or a conspiracy theory. Exactly. Or both. So as we're coming up close to the end here, any final thoughts on futurism, wish fulfillment in writing... And where would you classify yourself at? Mm, I would say uh, I'm good with wish fulfillment and futurism so long as it's awesome or interesting to read. I think, uh, you know, like, you don't want Mary Sue kind of things going on. You don't want, like, uh, the little diorama of the future. 
But, you know, something that's a little interesting, maybe isn't completely realistic, I think that's fine. And uh, it can be totally interesting and worthwhile to read. Okay. Uh, and I, uh, personally, probably, I don't think I have the scientific background to be a futurist. So it's mostly wish fulfillment. <laughs> yeah, I, for me, in my own writing and what I like in other people's writing, for your premises... So your rules for universe can be anything you want. So that can be wish fulfillment. But once you establish those rules, you need to follow them or the story doesn't make sense. So if you want to have, you know, uh, raindrops of gold falling out of the sky, that's fine. It's just you have Ouch. to have all the implications of, you know, people getting concussions and such. You know? <laughs> it's raining. Golden. Run outside with a bucket. Yes. <laughs> Don't. It's all molten. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I put a bucket on my head, and then I put a bucket out there. No, it's funny. I was thinking the same thing with the, <laughs> yeah, with it being liquid gold falling down. Yeah. That would be painful. Here's your crown. Yeah. Well, as a guy who writes mostly historical <laughs> fantasy, I would have to say that I am probably largely within the uh, myth uh, wish fulfillment uh, category there. Um, however, when I do write, I tend to write with an air towards realism, with an air towards you know actual historical fact. And then I just play with that. So, on some level, you know, there, there's no futuristic. Maybe there's a romanticism of the past and that kind of fun stuff. But when I do write science fiction, I do try and not just make it up. But there is that, too. My personal belief is write what you want to write. Yes. And don't worry about it. And if you want to write the future, uh, good luck. And mm -hmm. like most futurists, you'll probably be like a third right. Maybe less. Um you know, it'll be interesting which third. It's yeah. fascinating reading old science fiction. Yeah, that that's the point. Reason. Is inspire. You know, you're you're writing whatever you want and write it, but you never know what you write is going to how that's going to inspire somebody else to take what you've written and create it. And if somebody wants to create an airship that can totally fly, I will be right there with you. Especially if you can give broadsides. Yes. And land yeah. aircrafts in it. on it. Actually, mine's not big enough to land aircraft uh -huh. in. There, there, but there are ones that are big enough to do that. So. Since a lot of my science fiction is really hard science, or at least, let me rephrase that, has a lot of hard science in it. I would say I might fall to futurist, but I really don't want to claim that. I think I'm more in the wish fulfillment. But I like to throw out the questions of, yeah, if this happened, what if? So, and on that note, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to us today, and join us next week. And may you have a great writing week. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis' newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.